Okay, so welcome to again to chemistry, general chemistry, right? General chemistry triangle episode. The episode about the triangle, about the triangle. What are we talking about here? Well, what we're talking about in the book, is, uh, this is in section 1.1. And what they, what they talk about in the book is they, they call it the domains of chemistry. Now, where this comes from is, is actually a, um, it's, it's a way of understanding put forward by Alec Johnstone in, I think it was the late 80s. It had been revisited in the 90s, and it's been consistently used in the field of, in the, in the field of chemical education. And it's what's called Johnstone's Triangle. Okay, John Stone's Triangle. Now, what are we talking about in John Stone's Triangle? What, why are we talking about a triangle? What's, what's this use here? Right? What we've got is a triangle right? and what do we have with the triangle? We've got three corners, we've got three sides, and then we have the surface area, right? This is the first, the, 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 the first shape after the circle, right? Three sides, three corners, three edges, three corners, and then the surface area. Right? And what we're saying is that this represents our understanding of chemistry, that we can look at our understanding and our experiences of chemistry in the form of a triangle with each of these, with each of these corners representing a domain, the domain that we're exploring. Now, the thing about a triangle is that, and the thing about this particular triangle that I'm drawing here, if you look at it, each of these have the same angle, each of these have the same angle, each of these sides are going to be the same length, which means if I lift this triangle up and I moved it one third of 360 degrees, let me do that, I can totally do that, right? Lift it up and boom, right? It looks the same. If I do it again, it looks the same. And if I do it one more time, I'm back to where I started. Now, what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make is that neither of these things are any more important than the other. This is not the top of a pyramid. Uh, this is not the top of anything. This is a triangle of which this is simply one of the edges or one of the corners. Okay, so what we have in the three realms, so we'll do John Stone's triangle. We have, well, the one that I like to start off with, I always like to call the sub microscopic realm. Now, in the book and in other, in other material, you may encounter this being referred to as the microscopic realm. But I am of the, of the inclination that the microscopic realm is to us, um, it, it's, we're able to see in it, right? We've seen through a microscope before. But once we get beneath microscopic, the sub, right, sub being beneath, sub way, the way under, right, and a submarine, marine water, sub, under, underwater, right, the sub microscopic realm, the realm that is smaller than that which we can see, micro, see, micro is small, scopic, see, right, to see the small, right, we're talking about the sub microscopic realm the realm that is smaller than what we can see, right? We are limited in our perception of sight. We are limited to being only able to see a particular, you know, a particular level of finitude of the universe based upon the visible light that is capable of reaching our eyes. And, right? 
So I want to refer to this as the sub microscopic. Okay. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. That's the sub microscopic realm. Okay, so that is the smaller, and that's what we think of when we think of chemistry. Usually when we're thinking of chemistry, we're thinking of this sub-microscopic realm. We're thinking about atoms, and atoms moving around and rearranging, right? This exists, for us, for us, this exists purely in the abstract, right? We cannot experience this, we cannot see this, right? And it is an understanding of, of that which is smaller, that which is outside of our, our abilities to perceive through sense perception. Okay, so what else do we have? Well, I've been talking so much about this that exists down there underneath and between, you know, right, this, this, this the, the foundational structure of everything, right, and that's beneath what we can see. Well, there has to be something that we can see, something that we can experience. The world as it is to us, right, this table, uh, this table, this lectern, right? This screen, right? The big world, the, the big seeing, macro, macro, right? Micro is small, macro is big, scopic is still to see. So this is, I'm going to refer to this as the macro. Well, it's not that I'm going to refer to it. It is what it is, the macro scopic, right? And this is, this is the realm that we will be experienced directly in the lab, right? We will be performing experiments in the chemistry lab. We will perform experiments, right, in order to experience, experience the stuff that we're studying. This is, the, this is where the observations come from. We observe the macroscopic realm. We experience this realm. So this is the world as we know it. This is the world as it is. What are we left with here? Well, you know, we, we will see you know, there is a, we will make a relationship between the macroscopic and the sub-microscopic, but what are we missing? We're missing the way in which we talk about the way in which we talk about this, the way in which we talk about it, the way in which we relate these things. Right? We're missing the, the idea that, you know, as I showed in the first video, the periodic table, the organization of these things. How do we organize it? Right? We're not organizing it in the chairs. No, we're organizing it using symbols. Right? So it's the symbolic domain, right? the domain of symbols. Yeah. Submicroscopic, so as it is, the macroscopic, as we experience, the symbolic, the way that we are able to write down that experience, the way that we're able to share that experience, the symbols that we use to talk about the science of chemistry, and to be able to relate that to another individual, to be able to write it down for posterity. Okay. The symbolic domain. So here we have the domains of chemistry. Now, with every problem, we do not approach every problem with an equal knowledge of these. And sometimes we have a better knowledge of the macroscopic, and we're trying to explain the macroscopic air observations in terms of the submicroscopic, the theory, right, the mental model that we have put forward, and and you know we, we're using the symbolic as as the language in which to do that, or the language in which to solve the problems, right? So what, what can we write down as sort of like an example over here? Well, we could write down something like the fact that you know, 
that. What does that stand for? Well, in chemistry, that stands for the element helium. You know, it's a thing that exists in the submicroscopic realm that has uh, two protons and some electrons and some neutrons, and it's called helium. Right? And so this is the symbol that we use to describe that thing that exists, right? A macroscopic, what's a macroscopic experience of helium? Well, you inhale helium, what's the observation? What's the, what, what do you know when you inhale helium? As you speak afterwards, you're really feeling pretty high, right? You wouldn't be all like this. <clears throat> so, that's the domains of chemistry. As we approach many subjects in, the, in this class, many of the, the subtopics in this class, you'll see, you'll hear me referring to the different domains. Uh, you'll see me writing the symbols, trying to relate it to your real life experience but you'll see me rely heavily upon the mental model that we're building of the sub-microscopic realm. Why, how things are behaving down there according to the theory that we're using. And the explanation for why things are the way they are. Okay. So we go to the book, and this is once again, like I said, in section 1.1, the domains of chemistry. They go macroscopic, microscopic, I say sub-microscopic, right? Um, symbolic domain, right? The specialized language, symbols, graphs, drawings, the mathematics, images, right? So they, they, they approach this saying, oh, well, a good way to you know, understand this is through water, right? So what do we have here? What do we, what do we have? Well, we've got an explanation. We've got a visual, right? What do we have? Well, we've got liquid water. What do we have here? Ice, that's solid water, right? What do we have here? We've got the atmosphere in which there is water. Right? A humid day has more water than a less humid day, depending upon what we're talking about relative humidity or anything. We're not talking about that right now. But this is the macroscopic realm, the world that we experience. Right? What do we have over here? Well, <laughs> this is funny. I like this because what are we doing right here? Well, this is supposed to be representative of the submicroscopic realm. Well, what have we done in order to represent the sub-microscopic realm? Well, we had to have a drawing. Actually, what have we done in order to represent the macroscopic realm? Well, we had to use a picture. This is a symbol. This is a symbol, right? These are the symbols that represent how we write down that we're talking about a particular state of water. H2O as we know it to be. H2O as a gas, as a solid, or as a liquid, right? This is a mental model. This is the model that we should be using of a water molecule and the water water molecules in a liquid, right? You see, there's not much organization. Here is a solid, extremely well ordered. And here is a gas, what do we have? We get them all separated out, right? But in order to represent what we mean in macroscopic and a symbolic and the sub-microscopic realm, we've had to approach it through symbolism, right? An image, a drawing, and then letters. Uh, letters and numbers. So that's 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 it for John Stone's triangle. Um, and I actually believe, believe this to be the first video on YouTube talking about John Stone's triangle. All right. See you in the next one.